dinosaurs, okay? And how we know about dinosaurs, how we study dinosaurs today, and how that's changed. What you think we do as paleontologists and what we actually do as paleontologists, I mean, not everything we actually do, but most of the things that we actually do. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the dinosaurs are really important. We were having a discussion out in the gallery earlier that uh, because it, that people are interested in them. I mean, if I was going to talk about the same scientific concepts I'm talking about today, and I was talking about lizards, maybe about five people would be in here right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, one of my colleagues kind of refers the, to dinosaurs as the, uh, the entry drug for science for people. Because <laughs> you can talk about things like earth history, you can talk about things like physics, about uh, you know, engineering, biochemistry, applied math, all of these things. And if you do it about dinosaurs, that people are interested in just through, you know, kind of thought osmosis or something, they get something out of it. So, so I'm going to take us first on a little historical perspective and then talk about the, what we're doing now to understand some of these problems, which even when I got in the game, I thought were probably going to be intractable. We would never be able to understand these things. So I'm going to use, as the last slide said, I'm going to use the history of birds as an example because is that uh, understanding the entanglements about the origin of birds has always been one of the big questions within paleontology. And it's something which you know, my lab has focused on for the last 30 years. So birds, you know, where did they come from? I mean, they're almost thought of, even by ancient peoples, as something which were just so bizarre and so incomparable to other kinds of animals that, uh, that they were you know, almost mythic. So this is an Assyrian relief, sadly destroyed by ISIS now, but nevertheless, uh, it shows just that how people even looked at bird feathers is something remarkable, even in antiquity. Some of the kind of heavy hitters who like wondered about birds was Charles Darwin. And again, just because they're so special, they're so specialized for the environment, that he talked extensively about them. I mean, even to the point of saying this in a letter to one of his friends, that the, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever I gaze at it makes me feel sick. Because he thought that there's absolutely no way that his ideas of evolution of natural selection and gradual change could ever account for the evolution of something as complex as a feather. But then some of the other guys from Darwin's contemporaries got into it in Victorian England in the 1860s, shortly after the origin was published. One of these guys was Thomas Huxley. And Huxley was a brilliant anatomist, uh, wonderful, uh, no, no one's ever heard of him, supposedly a great speaker. And, uh, the, and he was able to you know, convince a lot of people and bring a lot of people over into this sort of you know, burgeoning but very early uh, idea of evolutionary theory. Uh, Huxley was also published a lot of papers on dinosaurs, and one of the animals which he studied extensively was Megalosaurus, which is a large carnivorous dinosaur, it kind of looked like a small Tyrannosaurus rex, even though they're not closely related. And it was one of the first dinosaurs to be discovered, and it was found in the English countryside. At the same time that he started looking at you know, bones of, of living birds as well. So on the far right is a Megalosaurus uh, tibia, lower leg in the bone, lower leg bone. On the far left is a living bird. And in the middle is a specimen of a Velociraptor. And although Huxley didn't know anything about Velociraptor, he was able to like, know that a lot of the features that he saw in Megalosaurus were identical to what he saw in living birds. So then there was that he was able to you know, study one of the first specimens of Archaeopteryx. This is the London Archaeopteryx specimen from 1861. And there's a story, I mean, it's probably apocryphal, I mean, some people think that it's true, but nevertheless, Huxley <laughs> was studying this, and he was also studying Megalosaurus, and he was also studying living birds. And he bought a goose for Christmas dinner, and he yanked the leg off of it to eat. And he had that aha moment when he said, wow, this looks identical to Archaeopteryx and Megalosaurus. And he was the one who really then had the origin of the idea that birds were a kind of dinosaur. So he recognized all these different features that were present in dinosaurs, everything from hollow bones to uh, three toes that all point forward to a wishbone to a bony breastbone. And all these things are present in some dinosaurs. So these are living birds. And these are some dinosaurs. So this is a uh, limb bone of a Tarbosaurus, a kind of Tyrannosaurus from the Gobi Desert. It's hollow, just like a living bird bone is hollow. Similarly, this is Velociraptor. So on the left, you can see a bony breastbone. And on the right, you can see a V-shaped wishbone. So just like living birds, the Velociraptor had a wishbone. So Huxley went on to say, so we 
we have had to stretch the definition of the class of birds so as to include birds with teeth and birds with paw-like forelimbs and long tails. There is no evidence that Compsognathus, which is a small dinosaur from uh, the Jurassic of Bavaria, possessed feathers. But if it did, it would be called a, it would be hard indeed to say whether it should be called a reptilian bird or an avian reptile. So everybody thinks this idea of birds being a kind of dinosaur is a new idea. This is from Huxley, 1876. Sadly, everybody forgot about it for 100 years. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but it's like didn't come out of it. But uh, so one of the things that you know I started several years ago was to develop something called the Therapod Working Group, and uh, in uh, 2003 we received a very large grant to be able to initiate this project. And the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to develop a, a, a very empirical basis for a family tree of uh, all carnivorous dinosaurs. And there's been a lot of people who've been involved in this. Uh, you know, not even all are pictured here, but you know, a lot of my students, postdoctoral students, Aki Watanabe, Amy Balanoff, uh, Ohenia Gold, Julia Clark, Greg Erickson, Gabe Bieber, some other of you who are paleo nerds, I'm sure recognize some of these people. But uh, now there's like uh, about 40 people who are working in this group, and uh, worldwide, Argentina, <laughs> Europe, uh, China, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, you know, pretty much everywhere. We just had a big meeting of the group a few weeks ago in Hong Kong where that, uh, we, you know, we've got some great new stuff that you're going to be reading about in the next year. But the first part of it was really to be able to build an empirical family tree. So the way that we do this is we take and we look at characteristics of different animals. So if you look at it as a, like, kind of like a, a table, like an Excel spreadsheet. So on one axis you have names of dinosaurs. On the other one you have characteristics. So it might be like three toes, might be two toes, that kind of thing. So you do this for all of these different animals, and then you use a computer algorithm to find the shortest path, path through this. And that gives you an empirical phylogeny. These are some of the animals. And uh, all of these, except for one that uh, we've excavated in Mongolia. So the one in the top middle, that's the classic uh, Wasserapter specimen uh, from uh, Mongolia. It was collected by my predecessors at the museum in the 1920s. But, Here's like Byronosaurus, Khan, more Velociraptors, Sagamagas, uh, Shana, Inga, Cytopodi, et cetera. So this is a great new sample to be able to actually look at phylogenetic questions because many of these things are very transitional on the way to modern birds. Uh, I've also had the great opportunity to be invited by my Chinese colleagues uh, since early on to work on the great Yashi biota from northeastern China. Uh, and that include the first of the feathered dinosaurs. So this is like the Maylon specimens, the D long on the upper left, which is the first feathered tyrannosaur, with the Sinoceropteryx, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Chidiotrix, et cetera. So uh, this has been a great opportunity, and I've had a great and ongoing uh, collaboration with the Institute of Bird Paleontology in Beijing, where I travel to about seven times a year. Some of these are really remarkable specimens. I mean, this is a specimen we call Inga, and uh, it's a, a very, very archaeopteryx thing. I mean, this is a small animal. The skull's only about two inches long. I'll show more pictures of it. So this is what people think that we do, and we do do this. I mean, we don't have to a lot. Okay, this is not fake news. This is like what we do. So, <laughs> this is, uh, we're in Mongolia every year, last 29 years, and we'll be there in a few weeks. This is at uh, one of the classic locales, a locale called Ukatoga, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit later. And we go to the desert, usually it's the desert, to excavate. But we don't always go to the desert. You know, sometimes, well, this is other parts of the desert. This is uh, my great expedition year colleague and assistant, Lynn Merrill, who's in the desert with me every year, and uh, like slamming away at uh, a beautiful dinosaur nest that we collected. But sometimes we go other places. I mean, we find fossils everywhere. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize when they say fossil excavation, it's always the Gobi Desert or American plants. Uh, the first dinosaurs found in North America were found 12 miles south of New York City near Morristown, New Jersey. So, uh, but we've, uh, you know, we didn't find a lot. We made some pretty decent finds in Laos over the years, and this is in Laos. Uh, similarly, in three weeks, I'll be off to Transylvania, where we'll be excavating in the town of Cluj, Napoca. And there it's kind of like, this is several years ago, this is like basically excavating underwater. Uh, we also, we have a drone that we fly around and we find bones on the sides of the cliffs. 
then we rappel down to the bones to, to excavate them. And we found some really great stuff. I mean, this is the hind limb of a very unusual animal called, that we call balor, which in Transylvanian language means a, a ancient stocking dragon. And uh, it's, a, it's a, I mean, for those of you, again, who are into the dinosaur thing, uh, it's a dromaeosaur. It's like Velociraptor. It has that big sickle claw. The weird thing about this is that it had two sickle claws rather than one. And uh, this place was an island back when the, this animal lived. And uh, whenever you get islands, you get real weirdo stuff. You look at places <laughs> like Madagascar today, or the Galapagos, things like that and stuff. So these things were evolving just kind of on their own out in the middle of nowhere. You know, consequently, there were some really strange animals. Uh, this is what the animal would have looked like when it was alive. And, uh, you know, it looks really ferocious, but uh, I'm sure almost everybody in here could stomp it to death because it was only about three feet long. So, uh, <laughs> so this is uh, our, uh, our latest family tree that we, we have. And uh, so you don't need to read any of the names. It'll mean anything anyway, but it does show that we do have some structures. So that, uh, this is with 111 different dinosaur species. This is 474 characters. Uh, actually, it's not 474, now it's 962. I forgot to update that. Uh, and we found 9,200 or 92,160 trees of equal length. And then when you mathematically <coughs> distill those and put them all together, you come up with this tree. But uh, we've uh, you know, had a pretty good run in the sense that we've uh, we excavated a lot of these ourselves, we named a lot of these ourselves, and we've worked extensively on a lot of others. But what this does, this tree structure, allows us then to make predictions about aspects of biology of the animals that I think that a lot of people don't realize that you could even make. This tree, if you break it down into the common elements, it's basically like this. We have, on the bottom, we have what's called aviali, and that's Archaeopteryx that Huxley worked on, plus all modern birds. Then the, the next group out are, are uh, dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor and Trodons, like Troodon, and then Oviraptors, and Therizinosaurs, Alvarosaurs, et cetera. So some of the questions that we've been looking at in my lab have been basically on you know, brain evolution, growth, size change, reproduction, feathers, and appearance. So looking at uh, uh, neuroanatomy, okay, that a long time ago, now it's a really long time ago, when I was a graduate student, I thought, well, you know, birds have really large brains, and so do marine mammals, okay? Why do they have large brains? So I thought that it might have something to do with navigating in a three-dimensional world as opposed to a two-dimensional world. But there was no way we could test it at that time. But because of the great sample of specimens that we got from the Gobi Desert and new technology, we could actually look at it. So about 10 years ago, we started. And uh, Amy Balanoff, one of my students, and I started looking, using Cascade data, we started to be able to create virtual brains of both living birds and non avian dinosaurs. So this is a living bird, and the colored area of what you see is the brain. So the olfactory lobe is the part of the brain which you smell with is that little blue area out in the front. Uh, if this is a mammal, the olfactory lobes would be huge. I mean, birds cannot smell, okay? They, they, they cannot smell, basically. They threw everything into sight. And when I say sight, it's really great sight. Uh, if a bird was in this room, and he's looking at out at you guys, you look totally different, okay? Because birds see way into the UV, like way into the UV. Uh, birds see an ostrich egg as being kind of a fluorescent orange color. Uh, we just can't see it. They also can see with many more pixels than we do. Uh, it's, so it's like using a really like old 1990s monitor and using a brand new monitor, old TV versus a new one. So consequently, they're able to look uh, you know, a hawk can see like a three-inch mouse and stuff from 500 feet in the air, so they can see a lot better. So they went all in for the optic globes, which is the purple, and then the cerebrum has a processing center to be able to process all this digital data. So this is kind of like what it looks like in uh, some closely related animals. So you have alligator, and it has a linear brain up on the top, okay? So it has a big old factor of globes, and then it has blue color, the cerebrum, and then the green color, which is the optic lobes. And you compare that with a pigeon below it. And the pigeon's got small olfactory bulb, a really big cerebrum, and a really big optic lobe. Okay. That's compared with some of the same kind of things you see in the evolution of pterosaurs, from primitive ones like Ramparinchus, 
to Anhan Gura, which is a, is a parallel evolution story, which you can see about, see in the gallery of Terrasars next door. So these are then brains, virtual brains that we built from living birds. So we've got like you know, a parrot, we've got like an ostrich. So it's the same sort of thing. The big bulbous kind of area on the top, that's the cerebrum, that's the major processing center, and we also have big optical lobes. But we're able to look at dinosaurs now too. So this is a specimen of called Zanabazar on the top. Oh, I should go back to this. I should mention one other thing on this, is that uh, you see the alligator brain is basically linear. Whereas the, the pigeon brain is S-shaped because the cerebrum gets so big that it grows over the top of everything else. And that's what we have in living birds. So here we have Zanabazar, a troodon from the Wake Chase of Mongolia. Uh, we have Allioramus, a tyrannosaur, on the, the lower right, and then we have an overraptor on the lower left. So as we go progressively toward modern birds, we go from the tyrannosaur condition, which is basically kind of a crocodile brain, it's linear. Uh, it's not S-shaped, the cerebrum isn't really big, there's fairly big olfactory bulbs. Then we go to the, uh, uh, the overraptor, and it's S-shaped, really big cerebrum, small olfactory bulbs, and then the, the uh, troodon, which shows basically the same thing. So basically what we're capable of doing is we're, we're capable of pulling brains out of animals which have been dead for over 100 million years in many cases, and to be able to like, look at them in great detail. Here we have, uh, on the top, uh, we have a, uh, is, is the London specimen of Archaeopteryx. In the middle is, a, in the bottom two are two different species of birds. So we can mathematically kind of like look at some of these things and we can create these plots. I'm not gonna go into this here, but we can actually just show this progression as you go from more primitive dinosaurs to more, to living birds that, that the non-avian dinosaurs get progressively more and more bird-like in many different aspects of their, uh, their anatomy. So I think if you just look at this top axis here, the middle one, C, is Archaeopteryx. And then we have D, which is uh, like a gal form of some kind, and then we have uh, a songbird on, on the upper right. But then B, I mean B is an overactor, and it looks just like Archaeopteryx does, basically. So our whole premise, you know, I was totally wrong when I thought this, is that you know, the flight-ready brain evolved in terrestrial animals long before flight evolved. I mean, the Velociraptor had the same kind of brain that Archaeopteryx has. So does brain size and shape change drastically during your flight? No. But then we tried to find out, well, what does this part of the brain do? And nobody had any idea. So, in birds. So uh, we started to look at brain activity patterns. So the way we did that is we used PET scans. And so this is a PET scan of uh, a human brain. So the normal cognitive activity uh, is on, on the left. And that's where there's, there's a lot of bright red in there. That's a high metabolic activity. So mild cognitive impairment. Uh, there's less red, more blue. And finally, you know, people who have dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease, that there's very little red and lots of black and some blue. Uh, but this is just basically, it's a map of where brain activity is happening in brains. So, we started out in kind of a kind of primitive way, we're just sort of trying to use PET scans using these, uh, in this paper we published using a, like a big PET scan, which that we would, it was originally we tried on rats, and this is called the rat cap. And uh, we, you know, we put this thing, it was kind of held down by like weights and everything on a rat, we were actually able to like look at rat brain activity in real time that uh, as it was walking around and feeding and stuff. We weren't aware of that, but I was really interested in birds. So then we started working at pigeons, or chickens rather, so we made the chicken cat. And uh, we were able to look at how uh, different parts of the brain would light up when exposed to the stimuli. But then the next steps were using starlings. So we, you know, we would take and we would take a starling and we made, we were able to like miniaturize the pet scan helmet itself put it on the starling, and we were able to like, look at the starlings while they're flying in flight, you know, wind tunnel, at, at real-time brain activity. And we published this paper about a year ago, and we found out some really interesting stuff. And it turns out that, uh, you know, we don't have to go into this, we'll talk about the general concepts, but it's a, that birds don't really use their brains that much when they're flying. And if you think about it, that flight is an incredibly energy-intensive activity especially in brains, and brains are really metabolically expensive to run, really metabolically expensive to run. But birds do use their, their cerebrum, especially when they're taking off and they're landing, 
because that's tied into their visual centers. And that, uh, you know, I work with DARPA guys quite a bit, and you know, talking to some of the aeronautical engineers, so they said, yeah, it's a really hard problem. I mean, for instance, that computationally, it's really, really tough to land a high-performance fighter on an aircraft carrier when an aircraft carrier is moving. But a bird can land on a telephone wire or a tree branch that's swinging in the wind. So as soon as that they, they take off, they use their brains for that, a lot of their cerebrum, then they go on autopilot. But then when they land, their brain just starts burning calories and calories and calories and calories as they're trying to be able to uh, calculate through their vision a place to land, as well as figuring out like what muscles, what you know, musculoskeletal stuff they'll have to use to do it. Uh, but this also explains why some birds can fly while they're sleeping, because a lot of birds sleep while they're flying. And, uh, 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 you know, things like albatross can fly straight through for like a week without ever landing. And they just get up there, go to sleep, <laughs> while they're flying. <laughs> Which is pretty crazy. We still really understand that. Uh, now uh, we're trying to like look at what some of the flight centers are. I mean, once again, we thought that uh, there's an area of the brain, a few kind of nuclei in bird brain, bird brains, which uh, uh, it's called the Volst. It's a term that's been known since the 19th century by German anatomists, and it's always been considered to be the, the flight center of, of the brain. And uh, that I won't tell you how they found it, because the experiments were pretty gruesome, but nevertheless, it was, it's basically considered the flight control area. Uh, if we look at Velociraptor, which is on the lower right down there, we can see, not Velociraptor, this is the Inga specimen, it's a troodon. Uh, the Inga specimen shows the Volst in the exact same place as Velociraptor does. So it clearly was not a flyer, but it had a flight-ready brain. All right, one of the other things that we've been interested in is looking at growth. And, uh, you know, you go out here in the park, you don't see any baby pigeons, right? Birds grow explosively. So, that really explosively. I mean, the chickens we eat are like six weeks old, that kind of thing. So, uh, so this characteristic of rapid growth is something we want to see if we can figure out in non avian theropods. So here's the pigeon example. No babies, all the same size. Uh, one of my close, probably my closest scientific colleagues, a guy named Greg Erickson, and he was the first one to really empirically show that these lines, which people had. had uh, uh, discovered on the inside of dinosaur bones and crocodile bones were actually yearly labels like tree rings. And the, the way he did this, there was a, you know, a sad alligator on the upper left, and uh, he uh, grew it for eight years. And every year on the same day, he would label it with a, you know, those of you who are old like me, you know that like, if you were a little kid, you got antibiotics and turned your teeth black, right? So it would lay down a ring, lay down a marker. But that marker was alternate with these other lines, so it was clearly a sign that this is an annual event. It's very poorly understood what happens, but now, as I'll talk about a little later, we'll be able to find that. And in addition to the annual line, there's a 28-day uh, lunar line uh, as well, tidal line, and uh, which you know obviously influences hormones and everything. And in the best preserved specimens, there's even a daily line that's laid down every single day yeah, that we've been able to detect. So one of the first things, and again, I mean, if we would have done this on a crocodile, nobody would have cared. But so if you're going to do some big innovative science and want people to care, you do it on dinosaurs. And not only do you do it on dinosaurs, you do it on Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm kind of in the bully pulpit at the American Museum because usually, like, if I was some like, you know, 20 year old grad student, and I go, so, hey, I want to cut a big chunk out of your T-Rex leg uh, to do histology on it. They I'd say no, but they know if they ever want to visit the American Museum again, they would say yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the Sioux specimen in Chicago. I mean, it's local, so it's local. And this is the oldest Tyrannosaur that, that is known. So it goes 17, 18, and 19. So it's about the same as human females in the sense that it becomes somatically mature at 19, or around 19 years old. Then there's a, a layer called the EFS, which is just the external fundamental system, doesn't really mean anything, where all the lines are packed on top of one another. But with the right microscopy, you can see that there's a bunch more there. So Sue was 28 years old when it died. So that's the Sue specimen. And the reason, the way that we decided not only could we age them, we wanted to figure out about, about the growth dynamics of it as well. Because if you're going to get to be a giant animal, there's two ways you can get really big. 
One way is you can grow longer than your ancestor. The other way is you can grow faster than your ancestor. So, you know, we went around cutting up different transars, and this is a baby transar that's in its 50 year of, uh, of growth when it died. And uh, we came up with this plot. So you've got transverse rex, displaced source, orbit source, and alberta source. Basically, all these transars hit somatic maturity at the same time, at around 19 years or so. So they all grew. It's just transverse rex just grew a lot faster. And not only did transverse rex grow a lot faster, it was growing really fast. So 767 kilograms a day, uh, a year. So that's about five pounds a day that it was growing uh, for a long period of its life, which I think really speaks to the kind of energetics and the kind of lifestyle and how much food this thing would have had to eat when it was alive. So they were growing fast, and uh, that, uh, and that they, uh, uh, you know, during this kind of like puberty teenage spurt between about 12 years and about 18 years, they were growing really, really fast, like three to four times as fast as its closest relatives. So we knew then that transars grew fairly fast, but they were still not growing as fast as the birds. But we were able to sample the uh, Munich Archaeopteryx specimen as well as a few of the other Archaeopteryx specimens. And this is hard because, I mean, like these are kind of some of the holy grails of paleontology and stuff. You can't be telling me you want to cut a piece out of it to be able to like, look at it under a microscope. Uh, they're not usually too happy. But, but the pieces that we took were very, very small. Like they were on the order of, I say, like, they're really they on the order of only like uh, uh, 10 microns across. And we had to deal with some incredibly talented that, uh, preparators who were able to take pieces out that were that small. So this is like looking at a fossil bone that's 140 or so million years old. Uh, that has been ground down into a thin section. It looks just like a modern bone does. I mean, you can see the individual osteocytes, the cells which the dead secreted the, 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 the holes that held the sites which actually secreted the bone itself. And we can see those different parameters on it. But when we looked at a bunch of the specimens, we were able to determine that Archaeopteryx, uh, it took about uh, 620 days for it to grow to adult maturity. Now, while that does not sound fast, it is a lot faster than crocodiles, and it's a lot faster than, uh, than you know, typical reptiles do for something of that mass. Uh, but it's slow compared to a modern bird, but it is transitional in between modern birds and more typical non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, you think about it, it takes it like an adult ostrich that can weigh like 150, 170 pounds. It takes almost two years for that to mature, but that's a lot more, so it is growing more quickly. One of the things also is that uh, compared to, like crocodiles compared to uh, uh, living birds, is that living birds hatch a lot more quickly. So this is a paper that just came out last fall, and uh, we found a, a nest of embryos in Mongolia, and this is, uh, in the A figure. The A figure is a nest of about 13 protoceratops that were still inside the eggs. So we were able to use very high resolution uh, imaging, CAT scan imaging as well as thin sections, of uh, the teeth on the inside. And here these were well enough preserved that we could actually calculate the daily lines on the inside of the teeth. So we were able to determine how long these animals were inside the nest. So on this plot, the only thing that makes any difference is that you see that uh, you know all the stuff on the bottom, uh, the bottom cluster, those are all living birds. All the stuff on the top cluster is uh, uh, is uh, living reptiles. Okay, and then we have two dinosaurs: we have Proceratops and we have Papakosaurus. And again, it's transitional in between what you see in typical that uh, reptiles and what you see in, in birds. So it's the same story over and over and over in all these different character systems, is that uh, the dinosaurs that are most closely related to living birds show the most characteristics of living birds. So we also have you know, these new technologies where we're able to peer inside of the eggs. And this is a, a, a Cretaceous dinosaur egg with an embryo on the inside of it, uh, which is uh, we can pull out the bones with these things that under no circumstances could be physically prepared. Uh, we have lots of different dinosaur nests with embryos in them from the Gobi Desert. So this is a this is a troodontic nest from the Gobi Desert. Uh, this is a uh, anatomic bird nest from the Gobi Desert. And using these new technologies, we're able to see some really amazing things. Uh, this is the skull of a developing embryo on the inside of one of the eggs. And what's so spectacular about this is there's no way we'd ever see this without this technology because this this entire skull is. Uh, it's about three-eighths of an inch long. 
and developing inside the edge. So this is like next generation imagery that we'll be able to use to like look through. So patch of growth, okay. Uh, do the rapid growth rates see the modern birds appear in non native theropods? No, they accelerate as one closes in on living birds. Again, as part of this then, I mean that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, birds are unique because birds are all fully grown before they can breed. So the somatic maturity, full growth, uh, is equivalent to sexual maturity. In most animals, our cells, crocodiles, and everything else, that's not true. I mean, we, you know, uh, human females uh, reach uh, full growth at about 19 years old. Uh, human males reach full size at about 25, 26 years old. So, that, uh, uh, yeah, we could have kids long before that. So we wanted to see if that was present in dinosaurs or not. So I can skip over that. We have a great sample of a, of a animal sitting on nests that we've excavated in the Gobi Desert. This is the, one of the famous ones, the Cytopati specimen that I found in, at Uka Tolga in, in the 90s. And it's an adult dinosaur sitting on top of a nest of eggs. We presume that it's a parent, okay? We don't know whether it's whether it's a male or it's a female, but we assume it's a parent because it, in living birds, it's about 50-50 whether the males include the, the eggs or the females do. So we were able to use the same sorts of techniques and we were able to look at everything that we have nests for, Trodon, Cytopide, there's an Oviraptor, Deinonychus, Oviraptor, Stogons, Oviraptor, everything else. What we're able to determine is, is that if you look at a lizard, they reach sexual maturity at about 60% of adult size, uh, if you look at an alligator or crocodile, the closest living relative to modern birds that we were able to find out, they it's a, almost 70% quantity, whereas in living birds, they have to be 100%. So in these animals, we found out that, uh, that uh, they were about 95% looking at all of them, fully grown when they were, when they were breeding. So it, it's transitional once again. One of the new problems that we've been looking at in the lab are, uh, is egg color. And uh, that uh, birds are the only living backbone animals that lay colored eggs. I mean, crocodiles, turtles, lizards, even egg-laying mammals uh, don't lay colored eggs. And Darwin was the first to recognize this. He wrote about it, that eggshell color was a unique character of birds. And that, uh, so we tried to see if we could find it in dinosaur eggs. And this is work that uh, uh, I'm working on with uh, Yasmina Weissman, uh, who recently joined the group. And that if you break down the colors of eggshells, so you think about like you know, robin's eggs, quail eggs, brown chicken eggs, white chicken eggs that don't appear white to birds because they actually have color, we just can't see it. Uh, but, uh, they, uh, it's all caused by just two compounds, and, uh, a compound called phytoperiferin and a compound called biliverdin. And these compounds are laid down in the eggshell uh, during the development of the egg on the inside. So they're not just like painted on the outside of the egg, they're actually incorporated into the crystal lattice. What's going on? Yeah, so here's some examples. I mean, that, and again, this is not how a bird would see these at all. Birds seem totally different, but for our vision, that, uh, that uh, we have a, a vast diversity. So we can use uh, a variety of techniques, and the technique, two techniques that we're using is uh, a, a kind of, um, microscopy called Raman spectroscopy. And using Raman spectroscopy as well as a, a spectrophotometry, ICPMS a spectrometer, we can deduct, we can conclude that we can find some of these compounds in dinosaur eggs. And this is from a paper that's out for review right now where we found both uh, Billy Burden and proto-peripherin. And this is what our data looks like. So what happens is you have your standards, okay, these two chemicals and you have those up on your computer screen. And then you run the, the, uh, the Raman spectroscopy through what's called a confocal microscope. And it just takes the spectra as, as the energy changes and you get these peaks and valleys like that. And then we can mathematically map those onto the standards and find out if we found them or not. And we did in fact find them and these are the animals that we found them. It's pretty interesting, to my mind at least, that, uh, that the only, dinosaurs that have colored eggs are uh, ones that are very closely related to living birds. It's that things like the sauropod dinosaurs don't, the hadrosaurs don't, uh, duckbill dinosaurs don't, but it corresponds with when dinosaurs went from having an open nest, or a, a covered nest like a crocodile, a buried nest, 
to an open nest. So that's when they first evolved color. So we see it in, uh, we see it in, you know, trodonids, we see it in over at Taurosaurs, we see it in, you know, all the things which we can, we see it in uh, dromosaurs like uh, Deinonychus, that they had uh, colored eggs. And some of them appear to us to be like bright blue, like an emu egg looks like. Uh, we've even found spots on some of them by using like, a variation of the techniques. So the, the, it's just another one of these characters, all these characters that go back that, uh, forever, that were considered to be just in birds. Now, Presage the development of birds by phylogenetically by a long way and temporally by tens of millions of years. The nest construction themselves, this is a sauropod nest that we excavated in Romania last year. Sauropods have the most lame nests in the world. I mean, the, the adult, the mother would just like walk along and dump the eggs out of the line, maybe kick some dirt on them or something later. Uh, so they're like what we call linear nests. Uh, this is a more advanced uh, nest, and these are. Uh, uh, you know, more typically kind of like what, what we see in some attacks of where we have good evidence that that depression that exists there was dug by the parent and the eggs were laid. And then we have paired eggs, like in the oviraptors. And the paired eggs are because it's like, uh, you know, living birds want to lay one egg a day. And that's because they have one open up. And that's always been considered to be an adaptation for flight and weight. That if you get rid of one over that, you, if you're flying, you don't have to carry around two eggs when you're flying. But so primitively, that we have uh, two uh, eggs laid each day, one out of each over duck. And we even have a couple of specimens that show that, where there's two eggs on the inside of the female that uh, are in the over ducks and preserved inside the body cavity. But then if we look at uh, troodonta nests, and this is a troodonta nest, so it's a close relative of living birds, but it's not a bird by any means. And this is a nest of eggs that uh, we excavated that had the hatched babies sitting on the top of the nest. And if you do a mathematical deconstruction of this nest, you can clearly show that these weren't paired. So we can make the argument that the loss of the oviduct had nothing to do with the origin of flight. It was already there when flight itself evolved. This is kind of an interesting nest in itself, because if you look at that egg at like a one o'clock position on the upper right, it has a white fleck. And so all of these eggs that hatch, uh, all the juveniles were sitting on top of the nest. But this is a shed tooth of one of the adults that's lying in uh, the, the hatched egg. So I think this gives us strong evidence. I mean, it's not total smoking gun, but it was strong evidence that uh, the adults were returning to the nest after the hand had hatched properly to take care of them. So I've only got a couple more things I'm going to talk about, but again, this has, just has to do with what we typically think of birds. Uh, characteristics that are present in non-avian dinosaurs. So anybody who has birds, chickens, parakeets, likes birds, watches birds, whatever, know that they try to roll up in balls like this. And the reason they do that is to keep their heads uh, warm. And they try to like make as little surface area as possible so that they dump the least heat. Uh, surprisingly, we found the same characteristic in a non-avian dinosaur, an introdonid. This is a maylong from a, uh, the what we call the Pompeii beds in Liaoxi in northern China. And uh, you know, what we've got is we've got the, the head, and then you've got the elbow, like right next to the head, and the tail wrapped around, is wrapped up in a ball. Uh, the way we can account for this preservation is that these animals were probably gassed, I mean, kind of like the victims of Pompeii and Herculaneum, and then buried in a matter of seconds by, uh, by, by fine grained ash flow. So this is the way, this is what my, my assistant Nick you know, drew it, of the way the animal would have died, showing the stereotypical behavior that we see pretty much uniformly in living birds, is again something which occurred long before living birds. A note about flocking, I mean these are you know, the gigantic, huge flocks of starlings that people see everywhere. Uh, and flocking and social behavior is something which is well known amongst living birds. Uh, we see that in the fossil record as well. I mean, this is a place called Ulsan, and here we've excavated an uh, entire flock of dinosaurs that was all killed by one event. So if you look at it, it kind of looks like a big jumble like this. And, uh, but if you deconstruct it, what we found is we found the remains of three adults. Uh, one was almost senescent, it was 15 years old. The other two had just stopped growing, but they were 10 years old. And mixed in with this were the remains of over 40 juveniles that were all in the exact same size co age cohort. So 
you know, if you watch the Discovery Channel, you watch any of that kind of stuff, you'll see these flocks in Africa of ostriches, and there'll be like a few adults, and then there'll be tons of chicks running around with them, all always in one size cohort. So this, we think, is the same sort of behavior. It's a behavior that existed long before there were living birds. And finally, I'll finish it up a little bit, bit about feathers, I mean, because that's something we were early in. Uh, feathers go really deep in the tree. Uh, I think you can easily make an argument now that uh, not only were all dinosaurs feathered, but that uh, feathers existed in the common ancestor of pterosaurs, as you can see next door, and dinosaurs. And I think we can even speculatively make the argument that uh, feathers are a characteristic for all archosaurs. So that's the group that includes crocodiles and dinosaurs. And living crocodiles are just a shadow of the original diversity of crocodiles that are limited to one ecologic zone. A lot of crocodiles that they were up here on the stage with me, you'd think that they were they were like miniature tyrannosaurs or other really weird stuff. And uh, my close friend and colleague, uh, Scott Edwards at Harvard, uh, I had him look for uh, a bunch of, uh, there's a lot known about feather coating genes in chickens because of their importance agriculturally. So I had him look for about 160 uh, different genes, uh, there are feather genes, in crocodiles. And he found most of them. They, they were just turned off. So I think that's, a, that's at least some evidence that perhaps the ancestral <coughs> artist was feathered. Uh, I'm sure, as you know, feathers are com very complex structures of the kinds of things that depress government so much. And, uh, but, uh, but generally, like feathers and living birds today, that they have what's called a rachis, which is that long spine. Then they have barbs that splay out from that, that uh, form the vein. And then they have microscopic, well, not really microscopic, but tiny structures called barbules that just work as Velcro, which so you can kind of mess it up and then you can uh, uh, retrim it and put it back together again and it looks fine. And so if you're going to find no feathers in the fossil record, that's what we have to, to find. Uh, well, this stuff really came to a head when the first one started coming out in the 1990s. So this is one of the areas we worked in the Liashi, uh, uh, near uh, one of the really small villages outside of Chaoyang in uh, the Yangming province. And that white area up above where that farmer is actually one of the fossil quarries. But the thing about these quarries is that they really preserve feathers really, really well. Uh, these are not dinosaurs, not, not, these are not, uh, they're dinosaurs, but they're bird dinosaurs and stuff. But nevertheless, it's an animal called Fuchsosaurus, and I think you can see a lot of the feathers projecting off the body of these things and just how well preserved they are. This was the first animal that was found, and it was called the Sinostrophus prima. And that black line you see running down the back is, is feathers. And the, there's a lot of confusion about this. A lot of times people reconstruct it as a, uh, 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 it's having basically a mohawk down the body. But when you look at these specimens, the, what you're looking at is you're looking at a three-dimensional animal in two dimensions. And I know it's kind of sicko, but like, I mean, I kind of, the only way I can really explain it is, is that say you had a really big book, and then you put a pigeon in it. <laughs> and then he started jumping on him, broke the car over And then he let it sit for a couple of years. Okay? And then he opened it up. You'd have half of the pigeon on one side, half of the pigeon on the other. A lot of feathers all over the place and nothing really in the middle. So that's what you're seeing here. So this thing really had feathers over its entire body. You just can't see them. Uh, this, is, this little town's so proud of it that they, uh, they made uh, the, the most foul tasting liquor in the world uh, <laughs> by Joe. And uh, that they actually put a little of the powder from the rock unit that, uh, that was found inside the bottle. And, uh, and uh, that it, in Chinese, that says, it says, a uh, uh, like famous Chinese dragon liquor, <laughs> or feather dragon liquor. Uh, but from the same localities, more and more specimens came out. So this is uh, the specimen of Sinusoroptrix. Uh, oh, especially known as Dave, that we worked on quite a while ago. And again, you're looking at half counterpart, part and counterpart. So this is like a pigeon in the big book, you know, it's just opened up. So we have both sides of it. And if you look closely at this animal, its entire body is covered with feathers. Mm. Uh, this is some of the feathers, and you can see that the parallel lines that represents the, the, uh, the barbs coming off of the rachis. And if you look really closely at some of these specimens, you can see there's a center line, rachis running down, the barbs coming out, and then you see clumping of the barbs themselves, which indicates that they were self-organizing, that the barbing was with there as well. So they had these little velcro-like structures. So this is what the animal would have looked like. 
that went up with a Y, uh, which is pretty different from the way that drama stars have been typically portrayed in popular cultures, uh, you know, especially really Jurassic Park movies. Uh, there's some osteological or bone evidence for feathers as well. Uh, if you look at a turkey vulture, it has these bumps uh, in a petrel. They have these bumps on the, uh, the, the ulna on the oral bone. And these are where feathers attach. I mean, they don't really attach, stick in there. But in fact, with their pivot points, which allow them to be able to move the feathers to trim them when they're flying in the air. Uh, we found these exact same structures in a specimen of, of Velociraptor from uh, uh, Ulsan on the top. I and mean, they're smaller, but nevertheless, they're, they're there. And they're there in a lot of other uh, non avian theropods as well. This is the D Wong specimen, which I mentioned before. And this is the, uh, the feathers that are found all over it that give us good evidence that in the Tyrannus, the Tyrannosaurus were feathered as well. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is that, you know, after we found the feathers in it, that uh, everybody asks us, well, what color were they? And so we uh, set out to try to figure it out. And, uh, and it's not like I told a few people early before and uh, they thought I was lying, but it's true. I didn't really care what color they were. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to see if we were smart enough to figure it out. And, uh, so we started kind of dissecting the problem. And that, uh, so there's three kinds of color that, color, uh, that cause feather, feathers to be colorful. One is that there's structural color, and that's like iridescence and uh, cloaking color. And then there's two kinds of pigments. Uh, one are melanosomes, which are organelles. Uh, inside the body itself, and then the other are carotenoids, are different water soluble pigments that exist uh, you know, throughout the organism cells. Well, we found out, not we, I mean, it's a, the big we in this one, this isn't just a therapeutic research group, it was like you know, our group working with other groups. That, yeah, uh, you know, melanosomes, uh, we know they're present in living birds, they don't, they're not the really flashy, spectacular colors, they're more the whites. The uh, grays, the ruddy, the reds, browns, that kind of thing. But we can also find them in fossils. And so what we did is we collected feathers of an animal, like this is a microraptor. Each one of those numbers on the bottom is where we took a sample from. And we created a big database of, uh, of uh, melanosomes in living birds. So we looked at all these living things, right? And we found out that there's round ones and there's oblong ones. And we were able to use a mathematical te technique called geometric morphometrics to be able to distinguish these on a very fine basis. Um, that, uh, you know, that, I mean, that we had some of the people I work with lack a little creativity. So, like, the, <laughs> one of them named these, and he could have come up with a better name, but he called them the, the, the meatball melanosomes and the sausage melanosomes. <laughs> <laughs> We have to aspire to be better. <laughs> but uh, we also found that it's when you had uh, the melanosomes all arranged in a certain kind of order, like an E on the back of a, uh, one of the oriental iridescent ducks, that they, they create a diffraction rate. And so they become iridescent, like when you see a blackbird or a crow in really bright light. So this is like, this is, this is, uh, pigment caused by melanosomes, but then structural color imparted by the orientation of melanosomes. So in the uh, microraptor, down there in F, we found the iridescent color. So this is the way this animal would have looked like, and this is not a bird. And this is a close relative of velociraptor, uh, long before birds, or phylogenetically long before birds evolved. And it would have looked you know, like this when it was alive. So it's a pretty you know, spectacular looking creature of a bright, Blue black iridescence all over its body. But the real holy grail in this is going to be the carotenoids because of those are the you know, like macaws, uh, robins, and all these songbirds that are colors. Uh, sadly, is that carotenoids are uh, water soluble, so they're not present in large amounts in, uh, in fossils. But using some new advanced instrumentation, we are getting a handle on this. So this is the uh, slag synchrotron at Stanford, and this is the brightest light source in, on the planet right now. And if any of you ever drive between uh, Palo Alto and San Francisco, when you get there, there's, a, there's a, a line that runs under the freeway. Well, that's one that we did at the synchrotron. 
So what we do is we take and so this is the beam line coming in, the thing that's got the, 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 the blue cord on it. So that's the high energy beam line coming in from the uh, synchrotron array. And then we have the black thing on the right, that's a camera that allows us to focus the beam. And then we have a collector, which is the purple line. So then there's a robot in the back. So we put all the fossils on the robot, and it kind of works like a typewriter. It goes back, it goes this way, it goes down, it goes back, this way, it goes back, this way. And then we measure the reflectance that comes off of the, uh, the specimens themselves at different, at different energies. And when we can do that, then we can compare that with the standards, and we can come up with elemental concentrations in the parts per quintillions. So 10 to the minus 7, no, 10 to the minus 12. It's, uh, and what we found is that uh, this is, you know, uh, this is an Archaeopteryx feather, actually, uh, which we analyzed. But then we also analyzed uh, a bird from the Green River Formation. So this is a, about 40 million years old, and 45 million years old, and in visible light, you can't see any feathers at all, or no, no fossil feathers at all. However, then when we look for different uh, spectra, we see feathers all over the place. So the top one. Is, uh, it's all false color, but it's uh, nevertheless we made it that color for a reason. This is the uh, first oxidation state of copper, and the bottom is the uh, uh, first oxidation, first productive state of magnesium. So that we can actually you know, see that what chemicals are still present in tiny, 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 tiny amounts, and come up with uh, the colors that these animals were when they're alive. And not not surprising, but why I was just going to surprise everybody in this room? I mean, this animal is a primitive parrot. Turned out to be green, but you know, but still, at least we have empirical data to say it was green, and we're applying this technique now to a variety of other animals as well. So finally, what I'd like to leave you with, I mean, when I got into the game, these were dinosaurs. <laughs> now we have this, and not only we have this, we know a whole lot more about how they grew, how they lived. Uh, other groups were working on other aspects of things in their physiology. Know quite a bit how they breathe. They know quite a bit about some of the metabolic pathways and stuff of uh, the, how they're able to synthesize food. So, starting in a couple weeks, we'll be back out there again. Uh, this is Transylvania, and hopefully the water won't be too cold or too high this year. And then we'll wrap it up in the Gobi Desert sometime in September at the end of the year. Hopefully with a, a lot of great new specimens, and hopefully we'll have a lot of great ideas to be able to work on and avail ourselves of some of the new technology that we have to be able to study these animals. So, Thank you very much for coming.